Be your all. Welcome to Anamet Library Talk. At today's talk, we have distinguished speakers with us, Vladimir Bozinovich and Asnu Bilban Yalçın. Today's talk is entitled Modern Conservation, the Sculptural Decoration of the Church of Ascension in the Ravenica Monastery. The Church of Ascension in the Ravenica Monastery near Cipria represents the masterpiece of Serbian medieval architecture. Built sometime between 1375 and 1381 under the auspice of the ruler of Moravian lands, Prince Lazar Rebelianovic. It was meant to host the tomb of its cathedral and to function both as the, as the monastery church as well as the royal museum. The royal character of the monument was particularly emphasized by rich sculptural decoration conducted in the Moravian style that embellishes the exterior of the edifice. Since some of these reliefs were significantly damaged during later centuries, the research conducted by the Republic Institute for Protection of Cultural Monuments of Serbia aims to shed new lights on part of elements ornamented with sculpture, archivals, consoles, colonnades, and rosettes that mostly belong to the decoration of the original exonartics ex 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 and that are nowadays located in the monastery lapidarium. At this point, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Vladimir Bozinovic was born in Belgrade, Serbia in 1981. He completed his undergraduate and master studies at the Department of Art History, Faculty of Philosophy, University of Belgrade. Under the supervision of Professor Asnu Bilban Yalçın, he defended his doctoral dissertation, Origins and Iconography of the Sculptural Decoration of Churches in Moravian Serbia, 14th, first half of 15th century, at the Art, of Art History Department, Faculty of Letters, University of Istanbul. He is currently working as a conservator researcher at the Republic Institute for Protection of Cultural Monuments in Belgrade, Serbia. Aznu Bilban Yalçın is head of the Art History Department at the Faculty of Letters, University of Istanbul. She completed her undergraduate and postgraduate studies at the Art History Department, Faculty of Letters and Philosophy, University of Degli Studi di Roma, La Sapienza in Italy, and got her doctoral degree the, at the Art History Department, Institute for Social Sciences, University of Istanbul. She is a re-owned expert in the history of Byzantine art and the author of many scientific scientific papers published in Turkey and abroad. Since 2010, Professor Yalçın has been in charge of the ar archaeological excavation of the Euros Fortress on the Bosphorus in Beykoz, Istanbul. She is also engaged as a scientific consultant in the restoration project of the Karya Museum and Ayasofya in Istanbul. Dear attendees, please bear in mind that your video and audios are closed Please type your questions in the chat section. Your questions will be answered in the Q&A session. Now, I am passing the word to Asnu Bilban Yalçın. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eram, and good evening, all. And I'm very happy to be here uh, to be the moderator of, for uh, Vladimir Bozinovic, my dear student and uh, uh, who completed an excellent work on the Moravian sculpture of the late medieval period. Uh, he will uh, present today, uh, especially uh, his uh, observations, very important observations on the Ravanitsa uh, monastery church and its decoration. Of course, uh, his work uh, is on uh, progress, I think, because it's it's not an easy work. And uh, uh, he, uh, he he began this uh, very, very difficult uh, research because as uh, we know that uh, uh, the the so-called artistic phenomenon called uh, the Moravian, uh, sculpture, Moravian school of uh, sculpture still needs uh, a lot of uh, 
um, answers for many uh, questions. And uh, what are the origins of the school? Uh, what are the uh, identities of this uh, uh, stone workers, the artisans, the, the masters, and where they work it? Which are the uh, the main uh, main uh, monuments where this um, sculptural decorations are exposed? Are uh, are going on in the research of uh, Vladimir, of course. Today, um, we will uh, listen uh, his observation about Ravanitsa, but in a very uh, general, also important uh, frame of the old Moravian uh, sculptural school, uh, with his uh, origins, developments, and the influences that he, he it had and it uh, spread all around the Serbian and um, other territories in the Balkans, of course. I would like to give the la parola, the word, uh, <laughs> to Vladimir, and uh, we were all uh, happy to have you, and uh, we are here to listen. Please. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you for these very kind words. I am very happy uh, to be here. And uh, I am also very grateful to Anamet, Poch University, for this opportunity, because it is indeed a great privilege to be part of Anamet Library Talk. And I remember uh, during my studies in Istanbul, when I was living in Istanbul, I was spending so much time in uh, Anamid Library that practically uh, I, it was like my uh, second home. So I will uh, <clears throat> uh, just share screen with the presentation. And uh, at the beginning, I will, uh, I will point out that this research uh, was conducted uh, during previous uh, year as a part of a bigger study uh, uh, that was conducted by the Republic Institute for Protection of Cultural Monuments of Serbia. It was published during the modern conservation, uh, but the, the initial study is much larger and deals uh, in details with the sculptures of the Ravanica church. Now, I can assume that for uh, maybe most of you, particularly uh, colleagues from Turkey, uh, the concept of uh, the artistic phenomenon known as Moravia sculpture, Moravian architecture is not so well known. And the Ravanica church is one of the most prominent example of this type of architecture uh, that has developed in Serbia in the course of the second half of the 14th and first half of the 15th century. Uh, so at the beginning, I will show you, I will, I will explain you know, just the general uh, outlines um about you know about the moravian uh monuments with uh, sculpture decoration so here you can see the map uh this is the location of uh, the monuments that uh, for which we know that they were ornamented with sculpture decoration not all of them are unfortunately preserved nowadays but um they are all located uh, in the valley of three Morava rivers, uh, Great Morava, uh, West Morava, and South Morava River. And for this reason, we call these monuments Moravian monuments. But there is also another characteristic which is important, which they share, and that is that they have a very elaborate uh, sculpture decoration uh, on their facades. Um, <clears throat> here you can see the examples of uh I'm sorry uh of two churches which are uh, very prominent prominent examples uh lazarica uh, and uh, kalinic churches lazarica is located um in the city of krushevac and it is a court church of uh, prince lazar hrebeljanovic who is one of the most important nobles from this period and also a ruler of Moravian lands. 
and Lazaritsa is built sometimes around 1377-78. Uh, the other church is Kalenich, and uh, Kalenich uh, was built several decades later uh, uh, under dictatorship of uh, Bogdan, who was a very prominent figure on the court of despot Stefan Lazarevich, who was son of Prince Lazar Hrebelyanovich. And here, for example, you can see uh, the uh, very rich, very elaborate decoration on facades of these two structures. And uh, there is there is a pattern actually that we can that we can follow in the distribution of sculptures on facades of Moravian monuments. Here, on these two prominent examples, you can see that both structures uh, were built in the opus listatum building technique with the alternating rows of brick and stone. And you can also see that reliefs uh, are distributed in the lower zone uh, uh, about the first string course in the, uh, on windows and before our openings and also portals. About the second string course, there is application of rosettes or roundels, which are all topped by archivolts. And also on the apses, on lateral apses of monuments and altar apses, there is application of colonnettes, which are all ornamented in sculpture. And in the zones above the roof, there is also uh, in the zones of dome pedestal and uh, tympana uh, of structures above an artex, there is also application of ornamented archivolts. Um, <clears throat> this is Ravanitsa church. As you can see, Ravanitsa is somehow different. Like it, it's architect in the sense of architecture, it is a different structure because Ravanitsa was built by Prince Lazar Hrebelyanovich as his mausoleum. But at the same time, it is also a monastery church. So two previous examples that we saw, uh, Lazaritsa and Kalinich are court churches and they are smaller in size. But Ravanitsa is a monastery church and it's also a mausoleum. So it's larger in size. It is a crossing square structure combined with Trikonhos base plan. And it also has five domes. Uh, as you can see, the distribution of uh, sculpture on facades of Ravanitsa follows the analogous pattern as on other monuments. The only difference here is, is that in the zone of the second string course, uh, there are no rosettes, at least not on lateral facades, but the application of windows, like in the lower zone. But I will get back to this topic later. First, I will show you, this is the location of uh, Ravanitsa. Uh, Ravanitsa is uh, located very close to Great Morava River to the valley of Great Morava River. The monastery is located here. So practically it is somehow hidden uh, within the mountains, within the gorge. And this is maybe a better uh, picture here. You can see the exact position. It occupies uh, the terrain which was formed <clears throat> by the curve of Ravanitsa River. And it is, we can define it as a, some kind of natural amphitheater. So practically, the uh, position of the monastery was very well chosen. Uh, here you can see the general appearance of the complex. Um, the Ravanitsa, as you can see, uh, was a fortified monastery. Uh, unfortunately, due to many devastations of the complex during previous centuries, this fortification is not so well preserved. But fortunately, the church, at least the main part of the church, is well preserved. And also the structures that, that uh, were built within the complex are all of a uh, later date. So uh, here you can see a uh, dictatorial composition which is depicted on the west wall of Naos. And uh, the, the portraits that are represented here are Prince Lazar with his wife Milica and their two sons, Luke and Stefan, 
the older son Stefan and the younger son Wu. And it's interesting uh, representation due to the fact that the royal uh, couple is holding the uh, the model of the church. And on this model, we have representation of the appearance of the original outer narthex. As you can see today, unfortunately, the original outer narthex of Ravanitsa church is not preserved. Uh, the present outer narthex was built in the 18th century on the foundations of the medieval structure. So practically the structure in question here is was built in the 18th century, while the main part of the church is from the late 14th century. Um, I told you a little bit about the architecture of Ravanitsa, but here you can see the base plan. So it is a cross and square combined with Trikonho's base plan. And also the outer narthex of the church uh, had the form of cross and square. Probably the central bay was topped with some kind of dome, maybe even blind dome. This is only a hypothetical. Uh, it, it's only a, one of the hypotheses because we are not sure about this. Here you can see uh, one hypothetical reconstruction presented by scholar Branislav Volovich, uh, who was in charge of the restoration of Ravanitsa around the middle of the 20th century. And he conducted the most detailed and the most important study on the architecture of Ravanitsa, which was published in the communications of the Republic Institute for Protection of Culture Monuments. I think if I'm not mistaken in 1966, uh, but uh, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Um, so here you can see the appearance of the uh, original uh, outer narthex. It was, all, uh, as you can see from this reconstruction, it also had very rich sculpture decoration. And the outer narthex uh, also had these uh, bifora openings on lateral facades and probably uh, arcade openings on west facade. Uh, so now we can slowly go uh, and discuss topic of Ravanitsa sculpture. As it was mentioned, you know, in this short summary that was presented to you, and you can also read this from the Anamed website. Uh, unfortunately, the sculpture of Ravanitsa was significantly damaged during period during during previous centuries, and. Uh, the reliefs in the lower zone that are depicted on windows uh, are particularly damaged. Situation is somehow better on the north side of the structure. And uh, here we can see the windows on the north side of the church. And from these examples, we can you know, speculate about the appearance of other windows in the lower zones that were uh, very lavishly decorated in sculptures. Uh, mostly with representations of uh, adored or confronted birds, sometimes depicted in combat with snake creatures or uh, snake-alike creatures, or maybe even dragons, as you can see it on this, on this window here. It is difficult to speculate about the symbolism of these uh, representations, but it is interesting that perhaps in the case of this a relief that is depicted here in the tympanum on this window, <clears throat> we are assuming that this is representation of the story of the Peridexion tree from Physiologus, from medieval bestiary, uh, which was very popular in the 14th century Serbia. And there are also some translations from the 14th century that are being kept at the Hilander Mon Serbian monastery, Hilander monastery on Mont Athos. And the story of Peridexion uh, tree tells us about the doves that are hiding uh, in the tree from the snakes that are gathering uh, beneath the tree. So if the doves are uh, on the tree, they are practically safe from the snakes, which symbolizes, you know, uh, the triumph of virtue over sin, or more likely uh, the Christians who are safe from the temptations uh, and the scene when they're uh, in the church. 
but this is as I can say is you know this is just one of the reliefs that that maybe has you know certain symbolism, but we are not sure about others due to the fact that they are very damaged. Um, here you can see, for example, windows on the east side of the structure, on uh, on the uh, main altar apps and proscomedia and Jaconicon. They are significantly damaged, and the only uh, the parts of reliefs that are preserved, as on the central window, they appear to be later additions. So maybe they are not original ones. Unfortunately, again, on the south side of the church, in the lower zone, two windows are significantly damaged. While uh, the west window still has preserved decoration in tympanum, in the form of the medallion, which is topped by the ornamented archivolt. Uh, it appears very likely that uh, this type of damage on the windows in the lower zones of the church uh, probably is the result of the fire in the monastery. Because most of the structures that were within the complex were built of wood. And you know, this type of damage, uh, it appears that it was created by, you know, <clears throat> a very high temperature caused by fire. So the stone practically uh, burst under the fire. Um, but fortunately, in the upper zones of the church, uh, the reliefs are much better preserved. Here, for example, you can see the situation on the upper zones of the west facade of Ravanitsa Church. Here we have three windows. The central window is three for a window, and also there is a rose window in the tympanum above. Uh, the rose window of, uh, of Ravanitsa, which is located in the tympanum of west facade, is very elaborately decorated, but exclusively with geometric patterns. The, the rose window is uh, is surrounded by the decorative red, but it's also topped by decorative archivolt. And as you can see, also there is application of ceramoplastics, which was also very popular in the Moravian architecture. Uh, the windows uh, in the lower zone beneath the, ro the rose window are very lavishly decorated in, in reliefs but mostly with the uh, application of vegetative or foliate forms and geometric forms. Uh, particularly popular motive in the decoration of Ravanitsa is this um, Sasanian type of palmette, as we call it sometimes, practically a palmette in the outline of the heart. And uh, it appears that the sculptor who worked in Ravanitsa and presumably the same group also worked uh, in the decoration of Lazaritsa church, the court church of Prince Lazar. Uh, they used this motif quite often. So it was very popular motif in their uh, vocabulary of ornaments. Here you can see also uh, lateral windows on the west facade, the same principle. So application of uh, foliate forms that are supplemented with geometric patterns. Uh, on the north facade, also the windows in the upper zone are better preserved and very lavishly decorated in reliefs. The ornaments applied here are repeating the same pattern, but they are never the same. So there is always, a, in tympanum, there is an application of the Sasanian palmette which is surrounded by the geometric influence pattern and topped by archivolt that also has, like in this case, you can see it here, very elaborate uh, geometric decoration complex. And it's also interesting, you know, the type of stone which they used. So this is all sandstone, but uh, sandstone of different color. And this uh, pretty much contributed to the effect, the polychromy effect of the of the facades of Ravanitsa, next to the fact that uh, Ravanitsa was built in opposite statum technique, so with bricks and with stone. And it's also important to mention that uh, 
uh, that these sculptures were painted originally and most likely with red color. And the red color was also used, you know, to paint the bricks. So this effect of polychromy uh, was actually very, very important for the medieval artisans. This is the appearance of the upper zone of the north uh, facade, actually of the of the north choir apse. And uh, here you can see how many different types of ornament they used to, the Moravian artisans used to apply. So they used for the decoration of window uh, Sasanian palmettes, but at the same time they were applying geometric patterns on archivolts. Also, sometimes you know uh, uh, geometrical, like individual geometric motifs on the um, capitals of these uh, also beautifully ornamented colonnades. And this is the window on the east bay of the north facade, uh, which is more modest in form. Um, here you can see even some interventions from the previous uh, restorations, like for example, that you know, this type of stone, which is used here to supplement the missing part of the archivolt was most likely added during restoration works in the middle of the 20th century. And the same also applies uh, to this console here. Uh, it appears that this is the intervention conducted by the scholar um, Branislav Vulovic, and he deliberately uh, at the time used uh, the sandstone of the light color, emphasized that this is the part, uh, that this is the reconstructed part. But as you can see also here, the archivolt has very beautifully conducted decoration with the frieze of palmettes. On the opposite side, on the south side of the structure in the upper zone, the same principle of the application of ornaments and reliefs, combination of Sasanian palmettes in tympanum, uh, supplemented by the geometric pattern, and also application of split palmettes on the archivolt. So uh, the principle of application of ornaments is, uh, is always similar, but the ornaments are never the same. So, uh, there is no concept of symmetry in a sense that, they, that the medieval artisans, particularly Moravian carvers, they were not repeating the same type of decoration on both sides of the monument, uh, as we could maybe consider that today to be the case. Uh, and this uh, can also, this can often be a mistake during the restoration projects because from, you know, from our present view, we think, you know, that there is a symmetry, symmetry or ornament, symmetry in decoration, but apparently during the medieval period, it even seems like they were avoiding a symmetry. Uh, this is the situation with the upper zone of the uh, south choirips. And um, unfortunately, here you can see many interventions during previous uh, repairs of the monument. Particularly important, uh, were the works conducted in the 18th century where the, when the new Alpenartix was built. At the time, uh, the monk who was in charge of these works, Stefan Daskal, also conducted uh, restoration of the main part of the church. But they have used different type of uh, elements, sometimes even spolia, which were implemented in such way that, um, you know, that some of the solutions that we, for example, see here were not the best ones. But the, uh, the way uh, these this, uh, repairs were conducted is by the fact that the entire church was covered with, uh, with plaster and then painted in white. So this is uh, what has occurred in the 18th century and during uh, later restorations, particularly restoration in the 20th century, this plaster was removed. But also during this restoration, these type of elements were not removed. And uh, we can also see um, that, for example, when they were um, restoring this ensemble, like parts of the archivolts, they were adding parts with different type of ornaments in the 18th century, because for them, you know, the ornamentics was not so important as the fact that these elements need to be appropriate, like in size and shape, so they can just fix different uh, parts 
of facades. And you can also see that um, uh, here, for example, this is the east window. Here you can see some interventions that were conducted most likely in the 20th century. Um, but if we look towards the east part of the structure, and this is the southeast angle, uh, you can also see here that all of these archivolts uh, that are applied in the upper zones of the east facade, they were repaired. Maybe this is a better photograph. Also in the 18th century, but on, uh, in very uh, inadequate manner. So they were applying, uh, they were building in parts of the archivolts, which with a different type of uh, uh, decoration. And um, it is uh, quite interesting that during restoration project conducted around the middle of the 20th century, uh, it was decided not to remove these elements and not to conduct, you know, the reconstruction of the appearance of the archivolts, which was possible to do at the time. Uh, here we can see the principle which appears to be more closer, you know, to all of the tendencies in the conservation that we uh, are trying to apply today. So the minimum type of intervention in a sense and to avoid any kind of reconstruction. And on the other hand, what is uh, important uh, is that by this way, uh, we have preserved uh, one of the layers, one of the moments of history of the monument. Because you know, Ravanitsa was heavily restored in the 18th century. And still on the monument, you can see traces of this restoration. And uh, it, is an, it is important uh, uh, document in a sense about you know one period of history of the monument. So if the ideal reconstruction was conducted, we'll probably avoid and completely lost uh, lost this very important period during life of the mon of the monastery and the church. Uh, here is a very beautiful view on the domes of the church. Uh, so as I mentioned, Ravanitsa is a five dome church. Uh, it is, the, the dome pedestals of all um, uh, domes are ornamented with uh, decorative archivolts. The one that were applied on the pedestals of lateral domes are very simple in form. Here you can see, for example, you know, these are very, uh, very simple geometric patterns. On the other hand, the archivolts uh, that were uh, applied on the dome pedestal of the, uh, of the main dome are more elaborate in decoration. Here's uh, one of such archivolts decorated with palmettes, but as you can see, uh, it was also heavily restored. Uh, most likely these parts were added, the missing parts were added uh, in the 18th century. And also in the 18th century, uh, they conducted uh, some works on the main dome. And uh, we know this due to the fact that some parts of the archivolts that were most likely from the original outer narthex, which was uh, completely demolished, so they used part of the decoration for the um, for these missing parts of the archivolts of the dome. So this was also most likely connected, uh, co uh, conducted sorry, in the 18th century. Uh, so now slowly we can talk about uh, the outer narthex of the church, which is a completely a different topic due to the fact that the original outer narthex uh, was uh, demolished. And during uh, the works in the 18th century conducted by the monk Stefan Daskal, the new outer narthex was built on the foundation uh, foundations of the original structure. And uh, when the new autonartix, and the appearance of the new uh, autonartix you can see here, was built by the material from the old autonartix. So practically, they used extensive amount of spolia to build the new structure. But the new structure, as you can see, is very simple form and doesn't correspond architecturally uh, to the main uh, part of the church. 
And uh, due to this fact, around the middle of the 20th century, uh, the scholars were uh, thinking to conduct a restoration project uh, by which they would be able, uh, through which they were trying to reconstruct some of the parts of the original Altanartex, but within the walls of the present Altanartex. Let me show you how this looks. Here you can see, for example, that on the south side of the present Altanartex, uh, some elements of the original medieval structure were reconstructed. But they were reconstructed only from the on, only on the exterior of the outer narthex, uh, because uh, in the interior of the structure there are um, very beautiful frescoes from the 18th century. So they didn't want to harm these frescoes. So the project practically aimed to reconstruct, you know, some of the outlines of the original structure, but only on the exterior of the structure from the 18th century. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, for the construction of the outer Arctic from the 18th century, they have used serious amounts, extensive amounts of polya from the original structure from the medieval period. And this uh, drawing here actually shows you uh, how many elements were mapped that belonged to the original structure, to the original outer Arctic. One part of these elements was uh, was taken out from the from the walls of the outer Arctic from the 18th century, and some of these elements are nowadays preserved at the Monastery Lapidarium in one of the towers of fortification. But some of the elements are, are still built into the structure. Uh, this is the uh, reconstruction hypothetical reconstruction conducted by Branislav Wolovich, scholar Branislav Wolovich, of the original outer Arctic. And here you can see that according to this reconstruction, the lateral facades of the outer Arctic have uh, before openings, and the tympana of these before openings are decorated in sculpture with the applications of frontals or rose windows and topped by archivolts. Uh, while the west facade has two arcade openings and the central uh, portal, west portal, that also has uh, a medallion in tympano. This is a project that was conducted by Branislav Vulovic uh, uh, with the idea to reconstruct uh, some of the elements of the original Autonartix on the exterior of the present structure. But you know, uh, this, uh, the this type of project was um, created in a sense that uh, during these restoration works in the middle of the 20th century, they really found a lot, a lot of parts of the original structure. And for some of them, you know, they had enough data, enough, enough information even to conduct, you know, partial reconstruction. Like for example, of this tympanum, of this bifora. Here you can see, for example, maybe on the next slide, yes, uh, that parts of this tympanum were built in to the outer Arctic from the 18th century as polia, but they were still preserved in a good condition. So during restoration works uh, in the 20th century, they extracted these two elements and then, you know, they reconstructed the appearance of the tympanum on the south facade of the structure. Uh, these are the elements that generally belong to the decoration of the original outer Arctic. Some of them were extracted from the walls of the outer Arctic from the 18th century. Uh, but some of them were apparently discovered uh, later during other works in the monastery or archaeological excavations. And uh, during previous year, we conducted a survey of these elements. And, uh, you know, some of, the, uh, some of the elements were already presented in the study of Wolovich. They were, uh, you know, they're even... Uh, reconstructions of the appearance of certain elements. 
but uh, some of them uh, were not investigated at all. And uh, I, will, I will show you some of these elements that were not known previously, but they give us a very interesting insight uh, how the Ravanitsa's original Alternatrix might, might have uh, looked like. But as I said, you know, due to the fact that there are so many fragments preserved from the uh, original structure, um, there were projects developed uh, that aimed to reconstruct some parts of the original Alternatrix. And here you can also see that uh, these elements uh, from the original Alternatrix that are still built into the uh, later structure, and some of them even built into the walls of the fortification of the monastery. Particularly interesting is this medallion with the representation of adorsed griffins, which is also the emblem of the Republic Institute for Protection of Cultural Monuments of Serbia. Uh, this element here, for example, on this photograph, uh, is not properly identified and we consider it maybe to be part of the portal or, uh, or, or window frame, but maybe even part of the portal. Well, this part here, for example, is also part of the archivolt, maybe even, you know, of the main dome. Um, Depictions of griffins actually are very interesting, and uh, this is um, this is a completely different topic. Maybe we can discuss this also later. But you know, there there are some papers written about uh, this so uh, famous uh, scholar and professor Slobodan Churchic actually published a paper about the images of griffins in the uh, Serbian sculpture, and he proposed you know also uh, that you know. These images, this medallion with images of Griffin was maybe positioned on the south facade of the outer narthex based on the uh, some other uh, uh, analogies that he made. But you know, this still remains very hypothetical, and we cannot uh, really uh, establish with certainty where these elements were placed, particularly uh, rose windows and medallions. You know. Yes, this uh, medallion with images of a Doris Griffin is one of the largest in size. So presumably it was positioned in one of the biggest tympana on lateral facade, or the central ones, or maybe even on the west facade. But this still remains highly hypothetical. This is another uh, project uh, that... Uh, that was put forward, you know, as an idea for the reconstruction of the original autonartix on the exterior walls of the present, uh, of the present structure. And you can see that, um, uh, that this project actually aimed to reconstruct much of the appearance of the original uh, autonartix from the late 14th century. Fortunately, it was not conducted. And, um, you know, one of the problems with this type of approach would be particularly um, uh, because, uh, you know, this way maybe we can get the wrong impression that the outer narthex from the 14th century was built like this originally. And it, uh, but it's actually represent a hybrid structure which combines, you know, the appearance and elements of the outer narthex from the 8th cent 18th century and also you know, the elements and decoration from the outer narthex of the 14th century. Um, and also the idea was to build in as much as fragments uh, that were discovered. Uh, uh, and they are also located in Lapidarium, but, you know, the position of most of the elements would still remain highly hypo hypothetical. And here, for example, you can see that uh, in the lapidarium of the monastery of Ravanitsa, there are parts of archivolts and roundels ornamented with reliefs for which we are actually certain that they originate from the decoration of the Autonartix from the 14th century. And even, you know, by the size dimensions of these elements, particularly dimensions of the archivolts, we can be certain that they were applied in the, in the decoration of timpana but uh, still, you know, where exactly on the structure remains highly hypothetical. 
but at least for some of the elements, it is possible to do exact identification. On the other hand, there are some elements like these elements for which it is very difficult to establish the exact position on the exterior of the outer narthex. So for example, here, you can see the fragment of a double archivolt um, and only one such fragments, uh, only one uh, fragment of this archivolt is uh, preserved in the lapidarium. But it's a very unusual element and it doesn't appear anywhere on Ravanitsa church. So uh, practically this element had to be uh, part of the decoration of the outer narthex. And the same goes for these two consoles or brackets uh, that are depicting uh, images of fantastic creatures, most likely, but they are significantly damaged. And it's interesting that on both consoles, there are traces of red paint. So these, uh, uh, these consoles were actually discovered by Volovich, but he never published them. And uh, Volovich apparently did not know during his restoration in the 20th century, he didn't know about this part of double archivolt. And um, so the location of these elements uh, still remains, you know, somehow problematic, but it is maybe possible to establish uh, their location on the facade of the original autonartex if we look at some of the analogies that we have. And the closest analogy uh, for the appearance of the outer narthex of Ravanitsa church is actually the outer narthex of the Helander church on Mount Athos. So the, uh, the outer narthex of uh, Helander church on Mount Athos was, um, uh, it was considered at least to be built at the same time as Ravanitsa and other Moravian monuments built under the dictatorship of Prince Lazar Hrebeljanovic. But in the last two decades, there were several papers published about this topic. And nowadays we're actually considering that the outer narthex of the Hilandar is much older than the one of Ravanitsa. But it is interesting that uh, here we have some uh, solutions that might have been uh, analogous to the one which was applied in the uh, composition of the Autonartics of Ravanitsa. And we have application of two brackets with the depictions of uh, heads of fantastic creatures uh, that were applied uh, above the portal. This is the south portal of the Hilander Autonartics. And for this reason, we can speculate uh, about the about the hypothesis that two brackets that were discovered in the uh, lapid that, that are nowadays being preserved and they were discovered during restoration of Ravanitsa that are in the lapidarium of the monastery were most likely also located um, uh, above the portal of the outer narthex. And perhaps the same hypothesis can be applied uh, in the case of the double archivolt for which actually we cannot find any other position on the church or within the decoration of the outer narthex. And it seems very likely uh, that the double archivolt, uh, the most you know, lavishly decorated one uh, in the, you know, all the ensemble of the decoration of the outer narthex was most likely positioned also uh, within the decoration of the west portal of the outer narthex. So both brackets and the archivolt could have been the part of the original decoration of the portal of the outer narthex of Prince Lazar in Ravanitsa uh, monastery. Uh, yes, here uh, I just wanted to show you, sorry, uh, I wanted to show you the the appearance uh, of the outer narthex of Helander and to, you know, to compare it to this hypothetical reconstruction uh, presented by Wolovich for the outer narthex of Ravanitsa. And, um, you know, there are many similarities between these two structures. Uh, 
of course, the application of Bifora openings, also application of roundels in Timpana, decorated archivolts, uh, even application of dome or blind dome about the central base. So everything somehow points out towards the conclusion that the outer narthex of the Helander Monastery most likely served as a model for the construction of the outer narthex in Ravanitsa. But of course, this connection needs to be, you know, further analyzed, and uh, uh, you know, this is just just one hypothesis. And as I said, you know, previous scholars uh, they were argued about um, about the thesis that maybe you know the outer narthex of Hilander was built at the same time as the one in Ravanitsa, but nowadays you know we have a little. Bit different perspective on this matter, and we think actually that the one in the in the Hilander is old. And um, yeah, I will just show you this. In, I think in the end, these are um, two very interesting findings that are also located in the Lapidarium of Ravanitsa. These are two bricks. Uh, on one brick, uh, we can see uh, a geometric pattern. Uh, that was uh, conducted on the brick when it was still uh, fresh. And most likely it was, uh, the drawing was made by one of the sculptors who participated in the construction of Ravanitsa. And it's interesting that this, um, this uh, finding is still preserved. And while on the other hand, you can also see a drawing on another brick that has in great pattern of nine men's Morris game. It's a very interesting uh, finding also because it's a very ancient game. I think it originates from uh, Roman times and apparently it was also um, very popular also during medieval period. It's a game for two person. And um, these two findings actually gives us, they give us a very interesting insight um, into the life of the artisans who uh, were participating in the construction of Hrvanica. So uh, just to conclude, uh, I can tell you that the research that was conducted and that, that uh, you know, parts of this research actually I was able to present you here, but there is actually the topic is uh, much more complex and um, I didn't want to bother you so much with details, or maybe I already had. I, I, I have, I don't know. But um, I wanted to point out, you know, that um, still even today, after decades of the research that has been done on Ravanitsa, you know, the complexity of this monument still remains, uh, you know, uh, something that we have to work on. And it is an ongoing process. Um, and, you know, there is never final solution, apparently, because there are always new findings, there are always new discoveries, there are always new perspectives. And, uh, and this also applies not just to the decoration of the of the Ravanitsa, or the main part of Ravanitsa church, but particularly to its outer narthex. So even uh, so still today, after decades of the research that has been done, you know, there are still many questions that need to be answered. So I will finish with this, and uh, I will I will give the word to Professor Asnum. Thank you, Vladimir, uh, for a very interesting and detailed uh, uh, research of yours, and uh, we are very happy to hear about uh, this uh, <clears throat> interesting. Um, uh, your uh, observations and conclusions, of course. Uh, <clears throat> before uh, asking to the attendees if anyone has any questions, maybe I should begin to, to make some uh, of mine. <laughs> of course. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we discussed many times about uh, these topics with you, especially about the uh, Hilandariu Monastery uh, Church uh, decoration and uh, uh, the architectural problems of the narthex, of course. Um, uh, the, the Serbian, uh, especially the Moravian 
area, artistic production. Uh, it's, it's very interesting, uh, of course, problematic. There are many questions to, to solve still, but it's very interesting because despite the fact that uh, uh, the painting uh, preserved these uh, Byzantine characters uh, in, in, in this region, in this area, uh, the sculpture has uh, very original and peculiar features uh, that, uh, yes, uh, they have uh, has its roots in the Middle Byzantine Constantinopolitan decoration through the uh, Thessalian Macedonian sculpture of the 13th-14th century, but arriving in Serbia. But on the other hand, there is the so-called uh, uh, Adriatic uh, influence, uh, the so-called Romanesque, Adriatic Romanesque yes. influence, which is uh, not very uh, uh, European Romanesque that we know, but it has a very, uh, very different and peculiar uh, voices and uh, faces um, in this area. And uh, I would like to ask to you, what are the uh, the, uh, the the Romanesque, possibly Romanesque, or maybe I, I would like to say the Adriatic influences on the Moravian sculptural school? Uh, this is my question. Mm, yes. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting question. <clears throat> of course, it also the, the, the answer is, um, you know, not easy to give an exact answer to this question due to the fact that Moravian sculpture is obviously a hybrid. So it doesn't have this type of style, you know, doesn't have any clear uh, origins. And, um, but of course, before Moravian sculpture has emerged in the 14th century in the Balkans and of course in Serbia, before that uh, in Serbia, uh, the sculpture was predominantly Romanesque, and it was all from the Adriatic littoral. So the most wealth, uh, wealthy patrons uh, that at the time belonged to the Nemanic uh, royal dynasty, they used to hire sculptors from the city of Kotor in Montenegro. And we know this because uh, the Franciscan uh, monk, Vita, actually, uh, he was in charge of the construction of Dechany Monastery in Kosovo. Uh, which is very nicely preserved. And the sculptures are exquisite. And there is inscription stating that, that Fra Vita was from Kotor. And you know, the impact of the carvers uh, from Kotor who were present in Serbia at the time was, uh, was very strong on the later generations of stone carvers. So even due to the fact that uh, this influence from late Byzantine sculpture has penetrated from the south of the Balkans into the Moravian lands. It could not have erased the previous art artistic tradition that already has existed on this territory and that was pre predominantly Romanesque. So for this reason, uh, we can see that in Moravian sculpture, there are many depictions of rosettes, rose windows that have their origins in this Romanesque artistic traditions. Also, representations of consoles and brackets with images of fantastic creatures that are appearing uh, on most representative Moravian monuments, uh, monuments, but also in Hilandar. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which is quite interesting. But next to Hilandar, other monuments that were built by the patronage of King Milut, so also Bainska and so on. Uh, so these are definitely, you know, a uh, very strong influence of the uh, Romanesque artistic tradition on Moravian architecture, sculpture. But to go next to this, there are also these very nicely conducted archivolts with uh, very deep profiles, you know, sometimes double type of archivolts. So all of these actually uh, elements, they have analogies in the previous artistic tradition, which existed in Serbia, and it was predominantly uh, Romanesque. If I'm not mistaken, some scholars and the last ones is uh, in his uh, thesis, Melvani, says that uh, uh, <clears throat> the some pieces like corbels with uh, young boys' heads and uh, lions are made by the Western 
uh, sculptures from the Adriatic area and not the Serbian ones. What do you think about this? I think this is a very interesting perspective. Uh, Melvani, if I remember well, uh, had this hypothesis that there were two groups of artisans. One of them was originating from the Adriatic littoral and the other one was from the Byzantine Empire. Not exactly sure where from. And that they were working together on the projects conducted by uh, King Milutin. So uh, the church, his mausoleum in Bainska and also Hilander Church in Mont Athos. Well, it's very difficult to uh, establish the origins of these workshops. Uh, you know, it, I mean, they could have been uh, maybe Serbian carvers, but from the Adriatic littoral, maybe not. So this is, you know... Difficult. Yeah, it's difficult to say, yeah. But their impact was very strong. Actually, their presence and the um, their engagement in the construction of this very important monuments that were built by King Milutin uh, left a uh, very strong impact of on uh, later generations of carvers who were repeating similar models of decoration uh, on Moravian monuments. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Ciric, uh, Yasmina Ciric, uh, she uh, gives her congratulations uh, oh, thank for you so your much. presentations. That's very kind. And uh, and there is a question from her. Sure. Uh, uh, in your opinion, what is the future of restoration works uh, at Ravanitsa? Will the restoration work progress in a specific direction, like the possibility of attempting the reconstruction of at least finding the better solution for the South Bifora of the Nartex? This is uh, her question. Yeah. Well, what do you, you think know, about? this... <laughs> this... <laughs> <laughs> this project that was conducted around the middle, actually, uh, the, I apologize, my mistake. The uh, the project was made, uh, I think, in 1960s, but the, re the reconstruction was conducted around the 1980. So se end of the 70s, something like that. So uh, significantly later. And yeah, this project stopped for some reason because we actually see that the project that was made by Volovic, uh, and this project is uh, in documentation of the Republic Institute, uh, this project was not conducted until uh, you know the end. So for some reason they have stopped. They just conducted mm -hmm. the reconstruction on the south side and that was the end of the project. You know, the reasons why this has happened, you know, they could be various, you know, due to lack of funds or who, who knows for, for which reason. Uh, but, you know, this is an ongoing debate. Uh, we are not sure if this would be, you know, the best. I mean, it, it really needs to be um, it, the future. The future restoration projects on the sculpture of Ivanica need to be conducted with uh, a very, very serious caution. Not just to the fact that uh, it's easy to you know be, uh, to to go into the trap that you think that something is one hundred percent sure, some kind of reconstruction, and then to find out you know several years later that it was a mistake. So uh, the idea of reconstruction is always problematic, and for this reason, you know, this type of projects needs to be um, they need to be you know. Uh, debated and also if conducted conducted with 100 percent of information so not to be hypothetical so the uh, this is you know an ongoing project and uh, we will see you know in the, in the following years how we're going to approach this problem but it is important that we are that the part of the research is being done seriously and uh, we're getting more and more information Okay, thank you very much, uh, Vladimir. <clears throat> Maybe uh, I can ask you something again. Uh, about what I said before, the iconographical sources of the motives, because I'm sure that uh, between the attendees, there are, are young colleagues that they are studying sculpture. And no. uh, uh, of course, uh, they are... Uh, uh, not uh, close to the Byzantine, the Constantinopolitan, I mean, uh, works, but uh, 
the motives that you have in the Moravian uh, school, the sculptural uh, school, uh, what do you think the origins uh, can be, uh, the iconographical origins? Yeah, well, this really uh, depends from the type of the motives. Um, it appears that the Moravian artisans, they used variety and um, a variety of different types of motives. So something around 300 uh, different types of motives they were applying, at least on the structures that were preserved, that are preserved nowadays. And uh, the origins of, of different type of ornaments appear to be different. And um, for example, what, what we have seen on Ravanitsa, particularly in the decoration of windows in the lower zone, the application of a doors to birds, sometimes depicted in combat with snakes. This was a highly popular uh, representation in the, in the sculpture during this period and appears everywhere on Moravian monuments. It, applied, it is appearing also in the, on the Byzantine monuments, but also in the Western ones. So sometimes it's very <clears throat> difficult to have clear, um, to clear insight into the origins and provenance of the motifs. But for example, uh, these motifs of Sasani and Palmets that were extensively used in the decoration of Ravanitsa's windows, uh, they have very, very close analogy in the Byzantine sculpture. And they are appearing also in the decoration of monuments uh, in Istanbul. So, uh, so the Sasanian palmettes, for example, on one slab of Arab Jami in archaeological museum, then also in the decoration, you know, uh, of other parts of, of uh, uh, in the interior of the monuments, also like in Pantokrator and Zerek Jami, there is decoration of windows with Sasanian palmettes also. Uh, so this type of ornaments apparently penetrated into Serbian sculpture through this like, Byzantine influences and Byzantine connections. While on the other hand, these interlaced patterns, <laughs> particularly problematic to establish. Yes. Uh, so they can uh, they can have their provenance also in the Romanesque sculpture because they were so much used mm. in the decoration of uh, of monuments on the Adriatic littoral. So this remains as an ongoing debate among scholars. But yeah, this Romanesque influence is also quite present. Yes, yes, uh, thank you. It's very um, curious and um, nice, uh, the tondo with griffins that you show to us. Ah, yes. Uh, that... That's, uh, that's uh, reminds me far, the tondos of Venezia uh, has that, uh, that um, you know, uh, reminds me that's a Venetian uh, once. But uh, it's very, it's very nice. It's very curious. So what you can say about that? Yeah, that that motif is probably the most famous one from Ravanitsa, and it's also the 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 emblem of the institute. Yeah. And um, you know, Professor Churchic wrote a paper about the images of griffins in. Uh, late Byzantine sculpture and also Serbian sculpture. And he debated yeah. about the hypothesis that images of griffins were depicted on the churches that were mausoleum, mausolea. So according to this belief that griffins are important mediators in translating the soul of the deceased into the heaven. Mm. So he made several comparative uh, uh, like comparative analysis between several monuments where griffins were depicted. Uh, and he established that they are always being depicted close to the tombs. And therefore, he also assumed that images of griffins in Ravanitsa are related to the tomb of Prince Lazar. But this is only, you know, one of the possible hypotheses uh, put forward by Churchic. But in general, this problem was not debated so much. The origins of the motif. Uh, are quite interesting, though, because we find almost exact representation of that on textiles. Yes. And there are several uh, examples of this identical uh, uh, identical uh, iconography of Doris Griffin on textiles in uh, and uh, iconography which is specific to Griffins in roundels. 
And there is also this um, hypothesis presented by Henry Maguire, if I'm not mistaken, who uh, also posed that these griffins, they were depicted on the shoulders of the Byzantine emperors. So, you know, it's difficult to, stay, to, to say with certainty what is the role of griffins. Of course, you know, griffins were very important uh, in the medieval uh, iconography, particularly due to the fact that, you know, in, they're also being mentioned in, in physiologists, in medieval bestiaries, you know, due to this special characteristic of their body and so on. So the symbolism is always present. Uh, but I think that the idea presented by Church is very interesting that they might have had something to do uh, with the position of the tomb, Prince Lazar. While on the other hand, you know, they could have been depictions of some kind of like a royal symbol. It, it's not excluded too, but also remains debatable in a sense. But it's interesting that they're presented within the roundup. And these representations are closely related to depictions on textiles. Yes, exactly. Uh, Middle Byzantine textiles of uh, yeah, yeah. very oriental uh, yes, uh, sure, sure. Uh, with influences. I think there is um, uh, there is another um, uh, question uh, from Professor Marchionibus, Maria Rosana Marchionibus. Good evening, everyone. It was a very interesting conference. I would like to know if there are connections between the geometric and vegetal decoration of the sculpture at Travanitsa and the decorative imagery of miniature art or of metal artifacts produced in the region? Uh, produced in the region, you know, there is a, a connection with the with the depictions on that are on the on the icons. So revetments, revetments of the of the icons. Uh, particularly those which were produced in the city of Ohrid at the beginning of the 14th century. So we find very, very uh, close connections to this iconography. Uh, other findings, unfortunately, we don't have so much, but uh, uh, it appears that these ornaments are actually, uh, they, they were applied in the decoration of revetments of the icons very early even before they were applied uh, in stone. So this also remains to be, you know, um, inspected, this, this type of relation. But also, you know, different representation of uh, complex rosettes. They are also appearing on the revenants of the icons and particularly these interlaced patterns. So there is some kind of connection there. But there is also a very close connection to wood carvings. Actually, maybe maybe uh, that connection is much closer one than to one uh, which relates to the re revetments of the icons. Because wood carvings, uh, we have several examples that are preserved. And maybe they were even conducted, you know, by the same type of workshops. I mean, we are not certain, but it's not excluded that it's quite possible. Yes, it's uh, very interesting. Also, it's also uh, rich wood carvings we have from the from the region. Of course, examples uh, we have many. Uh, I I would like to ask to that in this if there is any other uh, that would like to make any question. Otherwise, uh, we are at the end of our. Um, uh, presentation and lecture and I would like uh, to thank uh, Vladimir Bozinovich and uh, the Anamet Library talk Talks that uh, give this opportunity to present his uh, wonderful work and uh, I was very happy uh, to be with all of you and uh, mm, uh, thank you again please Iram uh, that's all for me. Thank you very much you. for this wonderful talk. Uh, dear listeners, also thank you for your questions. Uh, Anamed Library Talks will continue in February with Mehmet Gantel and Chidam Kafescioğlu. You can follow the details in our website and social media accounts. Thank you again and good evening to all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening.
बाय बाय